Welcome to Out With Dan, the podcast that spotlights and examines the voices of LGBTQ plus authors, characters, and our allies. Together, we lift our voices and we tell our stories. I'm Dan White. Join me as I chat with this week's author. Hello, and welcome back to Out With Dan. Today, I'm excited to talk to Sabine Durant. Is that right? That's fine. I'm Darren. Close. Darren. <laughs> <laughs> About sun damage. So everyone will know I asked Sabina earlier to pronounce her name, and I still goofed it. So we're here, though. That's the important part. Welcome, Sabine. The one thing about my name that I always feel is rather a unique thing is that it's actually a football chance. You can say my name. like I don't know anybody else's name, which is S-A-B-I-N-E-D-U-R-R-A-N-T. There you go. I love that. <laughs> I may have to have you back to introduce every guest from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about this deliciousness called sun damage. My goodness, I love this. This is a con story through and through. Um, how did you come up with the idea? Well, I think um, quite, quite often I think um, novels come out of the book that you've written before. And my previous novel, which was called Finders Keepers, um, which came out in our first lockdown, was about a hoarder, a woman who lived in a house filled with possessions. She collected things. And I think the combination of having written that book and then being stuck in the house myself <laughs> during lockdown, my imagination basically went to the loveliest place I could possibly think of, which is the south of France. And I thought about somebody living somebody else's life. It just came to me that I, I suppose it's, come, come, you know, ideas come from your own experience. And really, for me, it was escapism. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I agree with you. The south of France is such a beautiful setting for this. And that's something you do so well that we feel and smell and taste the south of France. The opening of this book, it's just so magnificent. Do you go there often? Well, I was supposed to go there and I was going to do a research <laughs> trip, <laughs> which was then completely obviously banned, forbidden. <clears throat> so um, I have been there before. I had photographs on my phone and I literally, I Googled glorious, beautiful houses and imagined myself there. What you don't get is I became obsessed with seagulls, whether you had seagulls in the south of France, because at the beginning of the novel, it starts on the Côte d'Azur on the sea, at the seaside, and then it moves inland. And there were smells you can't get online and sounds. A lot of the videos I was watching of sort of markets had little music in the background, and I was desperate for a video that didn't have music. Anyway, I did then go back at the end of the summer and I managed to put in a few details. But by that stage, I was almost going to press. So it was almost too late. But thank <laughs> you. <laughs> well, it, it is. And I mean, I, I, I felt like I was there with the characters. And that, of course, is always for a reader. I think that's always so important to feel like you're really a part of the story. I mean, I felt like with Sean and Ali, I was right there with them. Good. So Sean and Ali are grifters and Ali... Um, at the beginning of the novel, manages to get away from Sean. You you get the sort of you begin to suspect that their relationship is a little bit um, that she's that he's a coercive it's a coercive control relationship. It's, um, so she manages to escape from him during a con that goes wrong, and um, takes on the role of their mark, a mark that unfortunately mm -hmm. terrible things happen to, which is not giving away too much and becomes a chef in a private house. So she is pretending to be somebody else and she is inhabiting somebody else's world. And it's incredibly important to her that she notices and picks up on everything that's going on so that she A, doesn't get caught out and B, so that she can use those details deliciously against the new marks who are the owners of this house or the inhabitants of this holiday house. So. Yes, I love the fact that when I'm writing, I, I often feel it's like putting on the clothes of, it's like playing a part. Mm -hmm. I tend to write in the first person. So you're, you inhabit the clothes and the person of your main character, and then you observe the world as they're observing it. And that to me is, 
it has you have to have a good character though i've gone wrong before when i've done that with characters who aren't that interesting whereas a grifter oh it's the best the grifter is the best anti-hero because they're obsessed with they're spinning a story themselves and also because they're very clever as a reader you you know what they're up to is wrong but you don't want them to be caught out and for me that is <laughs> <laughs> it is. And I think that's the deliciousness of it. So to get into that a little bit more. So have you ever met a grifter in real life or a con person in real life? Oh, dad. <laughs> Only, no, I, I know you're not Sabine. Not I know me. dad. But... <laughs> I have actually in a strange way, because I do. I mean, they're big characters and they're big cons, um, big grifters, they're career grifters. But I think we've all met characters who are basically grif We've all had friends that we've realized aren't who they say they are. And actually the friendship isn't quite what it what the, what you think it is. And I've definitely had relationships like that. And I definitely yes. use those emotions. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, and I, I think, you know, we get sold a bill of goods and sometimes we do it to ourselves. We see a package that's pretty and we we want it to be something slightly different. Absolutely. So we want to we, we run a con on ourselves. Absolutely. That and that, in fact, is one of the things Ali says early on, which is that you mm -hmm. use people's weaknesses, mm -hmm. their pride, their arrogance, their insecurities against them. I have to say, I did recently get a text from um, somebody who I know quite well saying, I'm in Greece and I was on a motorbike and my wallet was stolen and my phone was stolen and please could you wire money? And everybody says that's gone. It was actually my friend. So, <laughs> oh my <laughs> goodness, I would have assumed it was a scam. <laughs> I know. So it genuinely had happened to him. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, so one of the things that you do, because so with different authors, you know, some set their story, say, in the 80s or earlier when cell phones weren't uh, something that we had at our disposal. Here you set us in current times. And yet because of some of the remote locations, the cell phone doesn't work for whatever reason. Did you have yeah. fun toying with that? No, cell phones are a nightmare. They're a nightmare. Because, you know, <laughs> all those wonderful books, those Daphne du Maurier's that we've read and loved, um, Patricia Highsmith, they didn't have mobile phones. So these things happen mm -hmm. nowadays, you know. So in fact, I did one, I was, no, the mobile phone and the laptop and the iPad were real issues technically for me because mm -hmm. she has taken on this woman's identity and therefore... I just didn't know quite how much she could be using the phone and the iPad and in order to get into the person's life. And I just didn't want that. I wanted to have the claustrophobia of the house in which she was living. I didn't want the outside bits of world. So I had to, do, there was some sort of, you know, stagecraft that had to go on. But yes, mobile phones are a nightmare for the psychological thriller. <laughs> I, that's just what I want. Them. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i would think as well because you know with with us in real life everything is at our fingertips i mean we only need to hit a couple of search engines and we can find more than we ever needed to know and so i think that must be a tough thing seriously for a writer of a thriller because you have so many things you have to navigate and i did love the fact that Absolutely. there were just times where the phone wasn't within cell phone reach. And I think we've all had that exact same thing happen too. So I was like, yes. <laughs> in fact, from all stars, certainly when I've been there in the past, there are dips in anywhere that has lots of hills and landscape yes. and farms, there are dips. So it was very convenient. Yes. Only occasionally does it dip out. <laughs> <laughs> but it Thank only God. takes one dip out for something to be able to happen that no one knows about. So. Exactly, one of the exactly. one of the things with both Sean and Allie that I, you know, as a grifter and con people, they do have to take on someone else's personality. And when Allie assumes Lulu's personality at first, you know, as a reader, I'm like, oh well, this this you know is would be very difficult for me. Yet Allie's already practiced at that, and that was. 
you know, for my own revelation was such a beautiful thing and I enjoyed it. So good. And in fact, no, carry on. No, I was going to say, how fun was that to write? Because not only was Allie living her own life, but she was living Lulu's life and 18 other yes. lives as well. <laughs> no, it was great. It's really, it was really fun. I mean, I, there's a moment in, you know, technically you have the grift going on and these, um, the crimes, and then she lands in this house. And that's the second half, second two thirds of the novel. And to begin with, when I was writing it in the edit, I had her, I didn't have her alley enough in her internal monologue. I had to make her uh, um, tougher and stronger because I, and, and you know, it's a real balance. You want to keep the likability, but at the same time, she is a criminal. Um, but the <laughs> real fun was about her not, you know, so Lulu is a private chef and Ali has taken on Lulu's persona and they expect her to be a private chef and she is not a private chef. I mean, she is literally... Seat of the pants. And I love that because haven't we all felt that I'm quite a good cook, but I've suddenly found myself cooking for people who suddenly say, oh, actually, I won't eat wheat and I won't eat this. And you're suddenly panicking. And um, so I quite like the fact that you can draw on everybody's experience and yet blow it up. And there's somebody <laughs> in, the, in the villa who susses her, who notices that she doesn't know how to skin a tomato. And any proper professional chef knows that you put a tomato in boiling water and don't desperately try to peel it. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the fact that she was, she thought it was important what the bread looked like. So she spent a long time, so she takes a long time balancing the bread in a basket, not really, while everything else is burning around her. So yeah, that's fun. Um, and that's a, that's a fun in, thing. No, sorry, I was just going to say the way as well in which she, while becoming with somebody else, discovers parts of herself that she had buried or didn't want to face up to. And so to begin with, she's using the secrets that she discovers in the house and against the people, but gradually the people that she becomes, she realizes, you know, she sees the darkness in all of us and starts to sort of fall for some of these people and, and see their nice sides and want them things to work out well so that was fun too to kind of while also having this the absolute beat of a thriller going on seeing <laughs> somebody develop as a human being and for when you take on a, a position in a household and you're living with the people your griff takes on a very different persona because when you're staying at a hotel and you're grifting someone else staying at a hotel, you have separate rooms and you sort of have separate lives and you can run something. When you're enmeshed in a household, that becomes to the nth degree because all of a sudden there really isn't much escape. You're in it with them for every minute of the day when you're someone's household help. Yeah, absolutely. And also it's a brilliantly... Um difficult and subtle relationship that and I've been a, I haven't been a chef but I've been um, a nanny in people's houses and you're sort of part of the family and they say oh come and join us and they're all lovely and have a drink and it's all fine but there's suddenly you realize it's only on their terms if you sit down uninvited oh that's a terrible faux pas so the kind of the social niceties of it and the dance that she has to play completely without any training is also fun to to write and I hope to read. <laughs> it is, it is, it is really fun to read. Me. Oh, good. Say again. One of the things that I remembered after I'd written the book, I'd had sort of buried it because I'm so ashamed of it, was that when I was about 18, I was um, backpacking around Europe with a boyfriend and we had no money and we were sleeping on stations. And we suddenly remembered that his sister, who was about five, six years older, was working as a private chef in a house in Saint-Tropez. And we thought, having been on the road in railways, scuzzy for about two weeks, what fun it would be to arrive on her doorstep. So we arrived to visit this poor woman who was working as a private chef, her sister and her, her brother and her brother's girlfriend, all kind of backpacky and dreadlocky. And we just thought they'd just accept us. And she scurried us away and took us back to the station. And we were so put out. <laughs> Just didn't get it. 
Okay. <laughs> I, oh my goodness. I, yes, it's it is one of those things that you think, oh, here's kindred spirits, and it's like, no, this is work. Go away. <laughs> So one one lovely thing that you do with Allie is you have her interactions with the teenagers is so tender and so heartfelt. And um, I loved that. Um, do you have you have children? That's correct. Yeah, I have three and only one is a teenager still. The other two are in their 20s. Um, okay. And yeah, so I suppose I did use... Um, my experience with teenagers, particularly teenage girls, um, in the novel. And I sort of wanted them to be entitled and rather awful and um, <laughs> also damaged. <laughs> and that to begin with, she just sees entitlement and then she begins to see why they are as they are. And that's part of her education. Um, so, yes, I really enjoyed that. And she, then she begins to see them as marvellous. There's a moment when... They come down and they're wearing sort of bright red lipstick and they've done their great big purple eyeshadow and they've got lots of jewellery and they're sort of out there. And she looks at them and says they're magnificent. And I, that was important to me, that moment. That moment when and it she re recognises. And it works so well because, you know, here she had a very troubled childhood growing up. And then she begins to see them as, you know, small adults who also have a tr have issues, not necessarily as troubled as she did, because that's something that we learn about her and her sister at the beginning of the book, what kind of childhood they have. And it's certainly understandable how she gets to the place she's at, with given the childhood she had. Well, that's good, because, you know, it is a tricky thing when you have a first-person narrative who is basically a criminal. Um, <laughs> very delicate. You know, you want it's important that we sympathize mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also feel a bit of a distance um but for the sympathy it was very important that she has you, know, you see why she is as she is and how she's got into this position how she's been basically she's a rootless person because she's never been given roots so right. um yeah and i think yeah. i think that that's exactly what would happen in real life because it is you know, to be able to be a rooted individual versus someone who's rootless, they take different paths. Sometimes it's the same path, but mostly they take different paths. So, and then, of yes, course, and she and her sister had the same beginning, and yet different, tiny little decisions, tiny little choices. And, and she's given a few breaks. You know, Ali has been given a couple of breaks, and she's ruined them both. And <laughs> I think. You're supposed, yeah, I hope that we understand why she's done that. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly did as a reader because I, it, and it gave her more multiple layers. She, as you say, yes, she did bad things and she was a criminal. Yet at the same time, I really did root for her to win. And you know, at the end of the book, the outcome is some of it I thought would happen, some of it I didn't think would happen. That was one of the beauties of what you've crafted with this book. Is we see. I, at least this reader thought I would see one path and I saw different divergent paths. And that was so fun for me. Good. Oh, I'm really glad. <laughs> and are the you, will there be any kind of follow-up for these characters? Maybe, maybe. I mean, there has been TV interest. And one of the things that the TV companies were very um, keen on was the fact that it doesn't end conclusively, that there definitely is openings for more narrative more story so we'll see watch this space <laughs> yes i totally love it i want to see all of them again if that's what you want to do with them <laughs> thanks Dad. sure so do you have a website or social media you'd like to share with us um i'm on um instagram and twitter or x and also threads and um it's sabine durant um just my name very straightforward in all cases Lovely, lovely. Again, the book is called Sun Damage. It is out here in the U.S. now. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hang on for me just a second. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of Out with Dan. You can find more information about this podcast and its host at outwithdan.com. 
on Twitter at OutWithDan and on Instagram and Facebook at GoOutWithDan. This podcast is hosted by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network and the theme music is provided by bensound.com. Join us again soon for the next episode of Out With Dan.